I always cherish my dad's strong, broad back, and his commanding profile. Being in the same line of work, I constantly felt his presence beside me. So even when people would say, for a woman, I never took offense. But now, as I've aged, I think, maybe I was just pretending to be okay. Now, I'm truly cornered, feeling out of options. My name is Emily. I am 45 years old. I work for a construction company as a construction worker. One usual day at work, I was called in by my boss, Mr. Williams. Such a summons was quite rare. So I headed in wondering what it was about. We're hiring a new college grad soon, a young woman. But you see, we have quite a lot on our plate right now, don't we? It was a roundabout way of saying, we're hinting at you to leave. I didn't have anyone to confide in. In a male-dominated company, I, as a woman, often felt isolated. Of course, I had a few colleagues I'd chat with regularly, but I doubted they'd go against the grain to defend me. It's not like changing a part. But think of it as for the company's future. I'm counting on you. Mr. Williams, always saying the most inconsiderate things with such ease. Same old guy. The manager, Mr. Williams, always seemed to have it out for me. I suppose hiring the newcomer was a convenient excuse to get rid of me. Looks like it's time for me to leave. Same suggestions to resign were repeated until I made the decision. If they don't want me, so be it. With a nudge, I chose the path of resignation. To say I didn't regret it would be a lie. I had grown attached to the company, and despite everything, I loved my job. Over 20 years ago, inspired by my dad, who was also in construction, I dove into this field. When I revealed my desire to work in construction, you wouldn't believe the way my parents freaked out, especially my dad. He was vehemently against it. It turned into a heated argument, and it took days to persuade him. It's because she's so stubborn. My mom sighed, giving in before my dad did. Since I was young, my father often took me outside to show me the buildings he had worked on. Emily, look at this massive building. Impressive, isn't it? Your old man built this. The proud expression he'd wear at those moments is something I can't shake off even now. I could feel, even as a kid, how proud he was of his work. It was you who inspired me to join the construction world, so you have to take responsibility. I remember using those words to clinch my decision when choosing where to work. When I told my father to take responsibility, he had a mixed look on his face, as if he wanted to be happy but couldn't. Afterwards, I got a job at the same company as him. However, we only got to work together on the same site for a little over two years. He passed away due to an accident at work. Construction sites are always fraught with danger. One careless moment can cost you your life. Dad taught me that in the most painful way possible. Needless to say, after that, I became even more conscious of safety when working. When the grief started to subside, my mom suggested that I might want to switch professions. I immediately shot that idea down. Back then, quitting wasn't an option for me. If anything, I was determined to work twice as hard for my dad's sake. It goes without saying that the construction world is a man's world. If there were women, they were typically in design or administrative roles and seldom on site. At least, that was the norm when I first started. On the job, there were various challenges for women, making even regular tasks difficult. The biggest issue I faced was restroom. It wasn't feasible to set up a women's portable restroom just for me. I usually used the bathrooms at nearby grocery stores or hardware stores. Of course, if the situation didn't allow it, I'd use the ones on site. There was no women's changing room. I would typically get dressed at home and head to work. Riding public transportation in work clothes often earned me weird looks. It was an embarrassment you couldn't understand unless you've experienced it, and it took me a while to get used to. Speaking of work clothes, there were no designs specifically for women back then. I wore a men's small size. I had to put up with a nil-fitting outfit. Work clothes that are too big or too small make it hard to move and decrease work efficiency. I tried various brands, and it took a while before I found one that fit me right. There were many tasks on site that required significant strength and stamina. Some tasks, like moving materials and equipment, which men could do easily, were challenging for me. There were times like that. No matter how motivated I was, there was no overcoming the difference in physical strength due to her different builds. I made up for it by increasing my efforts and taking more time to handle tasks that required strength. It was also crucial to maintain a good relationship with colleagues, so I could easily ask for help when needed. 
But the most challenging part was my relationship with my superior, Mr. Williams, who had been treating me as an outcast way before he became the head of our department. He didn't hesitate to voice his outdated opinions. That was just how Mr. Williams was. What's the point of having a woman on site? She's just a burden and doesn't contribute at all. With the boss having that attitude, it's only natural for the subordinates to follow suit. I began to feel out of place at the site, and everywhere I went, I felt like I was in the way. There were times when I felt like I was walking on eggshells. I even worked with my resignation letter in my pocket. When things got tough, I would visit buildings my late father had worked on. I'd search for traces of my dad in those cold, lifeless structures, drawing strength when I felt defeated. Of course, I often visited the buildings I had worked on, gazing at them from a distance. Memories of the challenges and the little tricks I learned while building them would come and go. Though my involvement might have been minimal, the building stands there because of the effort I poured into it. This building is the culmination of my sweat and tears. In moments of such strong belief, I felt as if I had the same profile as my father, whom I once saw. I felt like my absent father was right there beside me, ready to catch me if I fell. Now's not the time to quit. I want to keep doing what I love. I want to be more and more true to myself. With that mindset, I persevered for over 20 years. It felt long, yet it felt short. It might end in an unspectacular way, but perhaps that's just how it is. I gradually reduced my belongings in the office. Then came my last day at work. As I finished packing my scruffy belongings and was wiping down my desk and chair. Um, hello? Sorry to bother you suddenly. Are you Emily? The person who approached me was a young girl, giving off a vibrant and healthy vibe. I instantly knew she was the one, the fresh out of college new hire, coming in to replace me. Nice to meet you. My name's Olivia. I greeted the girl and gave a slight nod. Though her official start date was tomorrow, she said she couldn't wait and got permission for a company tour today. Young people these days sure are proactive. I couldn't help but think. When Olivia told me she looked forward to working together, I felt conflicted. I'm sorry. Today's my last day. I won't be here from tomorrow. What, really? But that's not what I heard. What she heard? I was just as puzzled as Olivia. At that moment, the CEO or Rarity made his way over. Even though his son is the coup, he's still CEO at the age of 70, the founder of our company. Noticing my rather sparse desk, the CEO furrowed his thick brows. What's going on here? It was later confirmed that the CEO had no intentions of letting me go, and that Mr. Williams had used this opportunity to force me out. The CEO had plans for me to be the mentor for the new female employee, Olivia. The suggestions I had for Mr. Williams was completely his own doing. It seemed Mr. Williams's prejudice against me and his personal resentment led him to take such action. The whole story, Mr. Williams's attempt to justify his actions, and my side of the story and feelings were all laid out. Upon hearing everything, the CEO was furious. Who do you think you are, Williams? Thinking you can just decide on your own to let one of my employees go. The CEO's anger knew no bounds. Having reprimanded Mr. Williams, the CEO took this opportunity to also criticize the director for his other misdeeds. He sharply pointed out the director's harassment towards the few female employees, including myself. Hearing that several leaders from other departments also had issues with him, Mr. Williams was clearly weakened, desperately bowing to the CEO and continuously trying to justify himself. Watching him was just plain pitiful. In the end, the CEO persuaded me to stay, and Mr. Williams apologized. So, I remained at the company. It wasn't long before the director, who caused this mess, faced serious consequences. Afterwards, I became Olivia's mentor, teaching her everything I know, how to navigate the company, the ins and outs of field work, tips on efficiently moving large materials. What I shared most were my own mistakes. Yet, Olivia listened intently and took notes. I think she took it to heart, knowing that tomorrow it could be her making those mistakes such a diligent girl. Fortunately, there are now more women on the job site, quite a few are even behind the wheel of large vehicles. There are even unions for women working in construction, and there's a wide selection of workwear designed specifically for women. Thanks to the changing times, the environment of construction sites is rapidly evolving. It's a blessing that girls, even as young as my daughter, won't have to go through the same hardships I did. 
Olivia is a cheerful and lively girl, and she was able to fit into the company quickly. Her positivity and strong drive to take on challenges means she also makes her fair share of mistakes. Of course, I am there to back her up. I ensure she quickly learns what went wrong. Whether it's a success or failure, it doesn't matter. I want her to gain as much experience as possible while she's young. One day, while having lunch together, Olivia shared a surprising story with me. Her father had also worked in construction, and apparently, he had worked on several projects with my father. I often hear about your father from my dad. He looks up to him as a role model, she said. It had been a while since I heard someone speak of my father. To think that in someone's heart, my father still lives on just as he was back then. That made me tear up with joy. There was another person delighted to hear about my exchange with Olivia. It was the CEO. He said, with a gleam in his eye, The friendships forged on the job site are truly precious. I still regret the loss of Emily's father. I feel responsible. I'm truly sorry. The CEO apologized. He was such a caring man. We truly lost a gem. I believe my father would have been grateful to hear you say that. I express my gratitude to the CEO and vow to responsibly mentor Olivia into a competent professional. As for Mr. Williams, the CEO took rather severe disciplinary action against him. He was demoted and sent on a temporary assignment to an affiliated company. In essence, it was a demotion. Even with the departure of Mr. Williams, who was notoriously unsupportive of women, the company continues to run smoothly. Us subordinates often joke about how things are perfectly fine this way. There is a global movement for gender equality. In the future, not just in construction but everywhere, opportunities for women will undoubtedly grow. I'm conscious of the fact that I've endured through challenging times. Moving forward, I want to share my experiences not just with Olivia, but with many other women. I believe that sharing such experiences will spark numerous discussions and eventually empower them. This is how I've chosen to approach my career. It may not leave a tangible legacy like a building, but if it makes the workplace more accommodating for future generations of women, then it's all worth it. With this renewed determination, I had to work every day with my head held high, all the while feeling as if the spirit of my beloved father, whom I still deeply respect, is gently watching over me. Welcoming party for the new employees? Oh, Michael, you are organizing it, I see. One day, Michael, who works under me, asked during regular working hours. Would you join us for the welcoming party? Yes, among the new employees, there's a junior of mine. I was concerned about not having the opportunity to bond with people of my own age group. So, I decided to take the lead in organizing this welcome party to help everyone get to know each other. That sounds like a great idea. But... I wonder if an old lady like me should join a gathering of young folks. I said this half-jokingly, and Michael replied with a laugh. Come on, you're still young. Oh, you're quite the charmer. And I'm always grateful for your support, so I'd be really happy if you could join us. Really? Well then. I'd be delighted to attend. Absolutely. The date and place are. After Michael's invitation, I was informed about the date of the welcome party and the location of the pub where it would be held. And then, on the day of the event, after wrapping up my work early, I was heading to the pub. When was the last time I had a casual chat with young people, other than my own kids? As I was looking forward to this inside, I realized I had already arrived at the pub. In front of the pub, I noticed a new employee, Rachel, standing alone. Rachel? Is that you? When I called out to her, Rachel slowly turned towards me. Oh, Ashley. Rachel looked at me, her eyes noticeably red for some reason. What's wrong? Aren't you here for the welcome party? Why don't you come inside? I asked, puzzled, and Rachel responded with a wry smile. Well, this welcome party is only for employees with a college degree or higher. What? Hearing Rachel's words left me speechless, shaking with anger, I pulled out my smartphone from my suit pocket. Then, I made a call to someone. Emergency. Everyone, gather up. My name is Ashley. I grew up in a poor household, living hand to mouth from as far back as I can remember. This was partly because I didn't have a father. I was told that my parents divorced due to my father's infidelity when I was just a baby. Since then, 
It's been just my mother and me, with her being frail and unable to work much. So, I've been working since I was very young. I'm sorry, Ashley, for making you help out. No, it's okay. When I was in elementary school, I would rush home after class to help with my mother's piecework. She always said, I'm sorry I can't let you play with your friends. But back then, I didn't have close friends to play with anyway, so there was no need for her to feel guilty. Wearing hand-me-downs from our neighbors, I was somewhat avoided by my peers during my elementary school years. Well, I'm off then. Take care, it's still dark outside. As I entered middle school, I started delivering newspapers early in the morning, before dawn had even broken. I'll be working at my part-time job until tonight, so I'll be home late. Okay, understood. When I reached high school, I jiggled several part-time jobs. You could almost say I didn't have a typical youth. Most of my precious student days were spent working. I don't harbor any resentment towards my mother for this life. Would be a lie if I said that. There was a time when I raised my voice in rebellion, saying, I too wanted to join clubs after school and hang out with friends after class. My mother would just look at me with a troubled expression whenever I acted like this. Seeing her like that only made my irritation grow. Then, one day, my anger finally exploded. I wish I hadn't been born into this family. Seeing me cry and throw a tantrum, my mother, instead of her usual troubled expression, she wore a look of being cornered and hugged me tightly. What are you doing? Let go. No, you're hurt. It was then I realized, thanks to her words, that I was bleeding from my right hand. It seemed I had cut myself somewhere while I was lashing out. I'm sorry, Ashley. You don't need to push yourself for me anymore. I've been too dependent on you, and I'm sorry for that. From now on, do what you want to do. I'll work harder to make up for it. Her words made me realize something. After all, my mother never forced me to work. I've never seen her take advantage of my efforts to make things easier for herself. So why did I keep working without sparing time for fun? It's because I love my mother. And it's the same for my mother. She loves me too. I'm sorry. Realizing this, I stopped rebelling against my mother. Instead, we started working together more than ever to face our challenges. After that, I studied hard and landed a job at a major company with a high salary and good benefits. This way, I could ease my mother's burden a little. I decided to live my life supporting my mother, but I feel a bit tired. Having always strived hard and now working at a major company, I was feeling anxious about whether I could keep up the effort, bringing me to the brink of depression. At this rate, I fear I might become like a robot, devoid of any emotions, just continuing to work endlessly. However, an event happened that changed me. It was shortly after I had joined the company. A welcome party was held for the new employees. While everyone around was drinking and having a good time, I was sipping on a non-alcoholic juice by myself because I was underage. Perhaps because I wasn't drinking alcohol, people found it hard to approach me. No one seemed interested in having a drink and a chat with me. But really, I wasn't jealous at all. After all, just getting a job at a major company was something to be grateful for. I decided to just endure the situation and get through it as best as I could. So, I quietly continued to eat and drink alone. Amidst this, there was just one person who came over to me. Enjoying yourself. Eh? Oh, yeah, sure. The person who suddenly spoke to me was a male section manager from another department. Although he was a section manager, he was only 24 years old when he got the position. He must be really good at his job. As I thought this and observed him, he was holding a beer in one hand. I wondered why someone drinking would want to interact with me, who wasn't. Still curious, I responded to his question. Well, the food is good, so that's something. I'm here alone too, so let's drink together. What? No. I'm not drinking alcohol. Aren't you going to drink with someone else? I asked this, feeling puzzled, and he replied with a troubled look. Nah. Seems like everyone finds it hard to approach me. Is that so? Well, I don't mind drinking together, but I'm not good at making interesting conversation. When I said this, he smiled broadly. Then I'll be the one to tell an interesting story. With that, he began talking and, to my surprise, it was really entertaining, leading me to enjoy the welcome party before I even realized it. 
This was how I met my husband, Tyler Thompson. Meeting Tyler was a turning point for me, and because of that, I was able to work hard at this company. Tyler, who knew about my family's situation, supported me in continuing my work even after we got married and I had a child. We'll share the child care and household chores. Helping each other is what being a couple is all about, right? Thank you, Tyler. His support was invaluable, and I felt truly grateful to be married to him. With Tyler's support, I achieved an unprecedented rapid promotion in this company, becoming a department head at 42. The me who used to work frantically alone, to the point of exhaustion, is nowhere to be found now. Having Tyler as my emotional anchor and more important things in my life, I lead a more fulfilling life than ever before. Is the welcome party tomorrow? After dinner, relaxing in the living room, Tyler suddenly remembered and asked me. Yeah, it is. So I'll be home a bit late. Should I prepare dinner for tomorrow? As I asked this, Tyler thought for a moment and then replied. No, I have a meeting outside with my team tomorrow. We're planning to go out for drinks after the meeting. Oh, I see. Both of us have drinking events then. Let's enjoy ourselves. Yo, but you know, I'm a bit worried. Eh? About what? Well, I remember how you couldn't enjoy the last welcome party because you didn't drink. I'm wondering if you'll have fun with the younger folks this time. Tyler said this with a mischievous smile, and I just gave a wry smile in response. Oh, please. How long ago are you talking about? I'm a department head now, with many staff working under me. Building rapport with the younger team members is part of my job as a boss. Ah, you've really come a long way. After having such a conversation with Tyler, we spent the day as usual and went to sleep. And then, the day arrived. On this particular day, my work was busier than usual. Ashley, can I help? Michael, the organizer of the drinking party, offered to help, but I quickly shook my head. Aren't you the organizer? Go ahead to the venue and guide everyone there. But... Don't worry. I can wrap up this amount of work quickly. Saying this with a smile, Michael looked a bit apologetic but left with the new employees at the usual time. Left alone in the department, I hurried to finish the remaining work, and 30 minutes past the planned time. I'm late. I rushed out of the office and hurried to the pub. Drinking with young people other than my own kids, when was the last time I did this? While looking forward to it internally, I soon arrived at the pub. Huh? As I was about to enter the pub, I noticed a lone new employee standing outside the entrance. Oh. Aren't you Rachel? Standing there was Rachel. She is an exceptional young female employee, even as a newcomer. Why was she standing alone here? Concerned, I approached her and Rachel slowly looked up. Oh, Ashley. Noticing me, Rachel's face, strangely, was red around the eyes. What's wrong? Aren't you here for the welcome party? Why aren't you going inside? As I asked curiously, Rachel replied with a wry smile. Well, the thing is, this welcome party is only for employees with college degrees. I was told I can't join because I only have a high school diploma. What? I was taken aback by Rachel's unexpected response. Michael, the organizer, hadn't mentioned anything like this. I tried to join, but I was criticized by everyone. Rachel said this, trying to laugh it off, but her eyes were eerie. It was the first time I saw her looking so vulnerable. Her appearance made it clear she wasn't lying. Michael. I thought he was a humorous and capable subordinate. It turns out I was completely deceived by him, anger making my fist tremble. I took out my phone from my suit pocket, and then, I made a call to someone. This is urgent. Gather up. After informing them of the location and ending the call, I linked arms with Rachel and walked into the pub together. Let's go in. Eh, eh, but... Seeing Rachel's confusion, I smiled mischievously and said, Don't worry. If they won't include you in their group, we'll just make our own group. Upon entering the pub, I asked the staff to guide us to a large room. Luckily, since it was a weekday, there was one large room available. I informed the staff that a few more people would be joining us later and we headed to the large room. Then, what a coincidence, in the adjacent large room were Michael and his group. Noticing our arrival, Michael quickly came over to us. Ashley, you're here, but the welcome party is in the other room. 
Your seed is over here. Michael acted as if Rachel didn't exist, to which I gave him a look of contempt. No, thank you. I didn't realize you were that kind of person. Huh? What kind of person? Don't play dumb. You excluded Rachel just because she's a high school graduate. It's embarrassing to see such childish behavior in an adult, like leaving someone out. But to my words, Michael responded with a frivolous attitude. Oh, come on, Ashley. Didn't you know? This welcome party is strictly for college graduate new hires, not for high school graduates like Rachel. I didn't intend to exclude her. A welcome party that includes high school graduates will happen some other time, I suppose. Michael's vague words made it clear to me that he had no intention of organizing a welcome party that included everyone. I held back a sigh of exasperation and replied, I don't see the point in creating a separate occasion. Whether a college graduate or a high school graduate, they're all new employees who joined at the same time. Even with my explanation, Michael just gave a troubled smile. It's a bit complicated. I'm not discriminating against high school graduates. Maybe you're misunderstanding, Ashley. Then why is Rachel here? Oh, that. When we called for the welcome party, Rachel took the initiative to find and book the pub. You know, someone has to be there to enter the place and handle the payment, right? Isn't that so, Rachel? That's why you waited outside until it ended, right? As he said this, the look he gave Rachel was clearly one of mockery. Rachel, looking troubled, responded to Michael. Ah, that was. Michael forced it on me saying, it's part of the job. So, you're saying he pushed it onto you. Essentially, Rachel, you were the organizer. Michael shrugged his shoulders in discomfort. Come on now. I'm the one who gathered everyone for this. Organizing a welcome party for such a large group is quite a task, you know? Handling reservations is one thing. But this isn't a job for high school grads. I don't think that's true. No, no, college graduates obviously have higher work capabilities. That's why they're paid more, right? Right, everyone. When Michael addressed the new employees, who were tipsy from drinking, they started praising him, saying things like, Way to stand up to the boss. Michael, you're awesome. Good going. Tell her more. Bolstered by their strange encouragement, Michael grinned and said, you understand, don't you, Ashley, as a fellow college graduate? It was at that moment Michael said that. Well, well, it seems you don't quite understand who the director is. Startled by the sudden male voice, I turned around. There stood my husband, Tyler, and behind him were employees of various ages. Seeing Tyler, Michael showed a look of surprise. The president, and even the senior staff from the headquarters. Why are you here? Yes. In fact, Tyler was the president of the company we worked for. The reason he was kept at a distance at that welcome party was because he was the next president. Everyone was unsure how to interact with him as the future president, so they unintentionally distanced themselves. However, as a new employee, I was unaware that Tyler was the next president and interacted with him casually. This apparently caught his fancy, leading to his confession and our eventual marriage. A few years ago, his father, the then president, stepped down, and now Tyler is the president. Well, we decided to have a welcome party here on short notice. Is this the right venue, Ashley? Tyler asked me with a mischievous smile, and I returned the smile in kind. Yes. You arrived quite early. In fact, Tyler was the person I had called earlier. Last night, after hearing about the planned drinking party, I called Tyler and suggested having her party here. Tyler casually agreed, saying, Sure, why not? I turned to Michael and began to speak slowly. So, the welcome party for employees who are high school graduates and below will be here. At this, Michael's eyes widened in shock. High school graduates and below? You mean, Ashley is? Yes. I'm also a high school graduate. Is there a problem with that? By the way, the president is also a high school graduate. It's not just me and the president. Everyone here, they are all high school graduates. The employees brought along by Tyler. Their positions varied, including executive directors and managing directors. Even the younger ones are known in the company for their excellence, having led significant projects to success. Seeing them, Michael's face gradually turned pale. Michael, you said earlier, college graduates are obviously more capable at work than high school graduates. Can you still say that after seeing them? Tyler's employees, though not showing it on their faces, 
must be furious at Michael's words. The gazes they cast towards Michael were icy cold. In the midst of these stares, only Tyler looked at him kindly. Michael, was it? Why do you think our company has positions for both college and high school graduates? And um, for those who couldn't go to college. That's part of it. But the main reason is to acquire talented individuals faster than any other company. Everyone here who is a high school graduate is exceptional. You can see that from the director, can't you? He said in a guiding tone, and then stated clearly. In the end, educational background doesn't really matter. What's important is how much you can contribute to others, whether it's for customers, a respected superior, or your dear family. Working hard for someone else's sake is something anyone, regardless of education, can do. I love people like that. You too, working for our company, should be capable of that. Am I wrong? Faced with this question, Michael murmured, That's well. He looked away, and then finally bowed his head in silence. Hearing Tyler's words, I couldn't help but let out a small chuckle. To me, Tyler is a respected superior and a dear family member. When I reflected on his words, I felt like he indirectly said he loved me, and I couldn't help but laugh. Whether Michael grasped the president's message or not, I decided to lighten the mood of the gathering. Well, that's how it is, so we'll have our own welcome party here. Come on, Rachel, let's enjoy ourselves. The president will cover all our expenses. Eh? Oh, no, that's too much. It's okay, isn't it? Right, president? You'll cover it for your favorite employees, won't you? I playfully said this, and Tyler, with a wry smile, replied, Well, I can't help it. Enjoy as much as you like. And nodded with a full smile. The welcome party turned out to be a lot of fun. Rachel seemed to truly enjoy herself, and seeing her like this reminded me of myself back then, the day Tyler helped me. Did I smile like this on that day? Noticing my gaze, Rachel looked puzzled and asked, Ashley, is there something on my face? No, just thinking you have a really lovely smile. Rachel blushed and smiled shyly at my compliment. A month has passed since then. I am still supporting my department as its director. As for Michael, perhaps the president's words resonated with him because he sincerely apologized to Rachel afterward. But that's not all. Michael even volunteered to be Rachel's mentor. Considering what had happened, I was worried and kept an eye on them. But surprisingly, Michael was very dedicated to Rachel's training. Lately, it seems Michael has developed a bit of a crush on Rachel in a different way, which I find quite interesting. But leaving that aside, thanks to Michael's earnest teaching, Rachel has grown rapidly and has become an indispensable part of the team. I'm thinking of recommending her for the next project, and Michael too. Watching the two of them makes me feel hardened. Working hard for someone, it's really wonderful, isn't it? Striving for others is a beautiful and admirable thing, but it shouldn't be done at the expense of wearing oneself out. You can't work hard for others if you don't take care of yourself. With these thoughts, I returned home where I enjoyed a nice drink with Tyler, something I couldn't do back when I was underage. To prevent my mill sir from being overwhelmed by loneliness, I took a leave of absence from work. I aimed to support her by visiting the hospital every day as long as possible. You won't be able to handle the housework without me, right? Forget about me and go take care of the house as soon as you can. Okay, okay. Such conversations happened over and over again, but Sarah's health never improved. It continued to deteriorate. Eventually, that day came. After a few days in the hospital, Sarah passed away peacefully in her sleep. We were immersed in deep grief. Neither my husband nor I could stop her tears. However, despite being informed of her critical condition, my brother-in-law and his wife never came to see her. They didn't even attend a funeral. About a week after the funeral, suddenly they and other relatives came to our house to discuss the inheritance. Then, an unbelievable situation unfolded. People like you are what they call a lousy wife. You should feel a bit ashamed. My name is Laura. I married with my husband, Jason, and after we got married, I moved in with my mill, Sarah. My Phil had passed away from an illness a long time ago, so Jason couldn't bear to leave his mother living alone and suggested we live together. However, last month, Sarah also passed away due to illness. Sarah was quite an eccentric person. When we first started living together, I think she caused me a lot of stress. 
She was physically and mentally strong, powerful, and had a lot of determination, which made her reliable, but her difficult personality was a real hassle. Your cucking is terrible. You're inefficient. I'll take care of everything in the house, so you don't have to do anything. She would say things like that and never let me do any housework. Since I work full time, it was indeed helpful that she took care of the housework. Even though she said all that, I was actually grateful. I can help too. I felt guilty, and there was also a fear of what would happen if something went wrong. So I often offered to help, but all I got in return was, don't bother with unnecessary things. Sarah always woke up earlier than me every morning. She would prepare an elaborate breakfast and a hearty lunchbox for me. Moreover, when I returned from work, dinner preparations, cleaning, and laundry were all perfectly done. Really, you can't do anything right. What a troublesome daughter-in-law you are. Despite her grumbling, she would iron my clothes and handkerchiefs. Every time I saw her do these things, I was painfully reminded of how different we were. Even so, I did hold a sense of respect for Sarah. Though I'm much younger than her, I'm certain I could never become like her no matter how hard I try. And I genuinely felt that such people are rare. You're what they call a terrible daughter-in-law. You should feel a little ashamed. I was constantly criticized, but eventually, I got used to it. She said those things, but her actions were nothing but devoted. Surely, she must be shy and couldn't express herself openly. That's how I began to view things more positively. Gradually, I started initiating conversations with her. Eventually, I could even respond with a smile to her sarcastic comments. And finally, I was even able to joke back. They say getting used to things is crucial. And that seemed true for me as well. Finally, we were watching TV together while snacking and going shopping and on trips. Since lost my own mother when I was young, I came to feel like she was my real mother. So, I stopped using formal language with her, my energetic mother-in-law. However, she began to fall on more frequently. After multiple hospitalizations, she couldn't come back home for the past six months. Sarah, aren't you cold? I was indebted to her for all the things she had done for me. To repay her, I dedicated myself to nursing her every day. But those people. However, no relatives came to visit my hospitalized Sarah. Even Jason's brother and his wife, Sarah's oldest son and daughter-in-law, never showed their faces, despite my regular updates. Why don't they come? Frustrated, I asked Jason about it. He replied with a grim expression, well, you see, brother married his wife just a week after they met. Mom said, wait a bit, but he didn't listen at all. Since then, they've been estranged. That's not surprising. Marrying someone after just a week. But the problem didn't end there. The brother and his family spread lies among other relatives that Sarah had thwarted a long-term relationship they had. As a result, it seemed she was shunned like an outcast. That's a terrible story. Mom's a bit eccentric so nobody believes her. So, no one visits her because of your brother? Yes. Apparently, Sarah was already disliked by everyone. And because of that, the relatives didn't bother to verify and kept their distance. That's just awful. I felt genuinely sad and sympathetic. Sure, Sarah had a quirky character, but she was just a bit shy and awkward. I knew this better than anyone. Sarah must have been so lonely. It wasn't just the relatives who were distant. Sadly, she didn't have friends who would visit her at home or go out with her. Sarah had endured a lifetime of loneliness. Just imagining what she must have felt brought tears to my eyes. I have to support her. To prevent her from being crushed by loneliness, I took a leave of absence from work. Every day, I made sure to visit the hospital, wanting to support Sarah as much as time allowed. I can't manage the household without you, right? Don't worry about me, just go and get things sorted at home. Okay, okay. This kind of exchange happened over and over again, but her health never improved. It only worsened day by day. And then, that day finally came. After a few days in the hospital, Sarah passed away peacefully in her sleep. We were engulfed in deep sorrow. Both Jason and I couldn't help but shed large tears. However, even when informed that she was in critical condition, my brother-in-law and his wife didn't visit. Moreover, they didn't even show up for the funeral. About a week after the funeral, the brother-in-law, his wife, and other relatives showed up at our house without any prior contact. They came to discuss the inheritance. What? 
It was the first time I heard that Sarah apparently owned a large amount of land. As a result, the value of her estate was substantial. I'm the oldest son. It's only natural that I get the most. My brother-in-law immediately started with that. Hearing this, the other relatives began to get angry and saying that was ridiculous. Witnessing this ugly dispute, I felt a strong sense of anger. How could they talk about inheritance without attending the funeral? They must be out of their minds. That's right. At that moment, I remembered something. Sarah had entrusted me with a letter. If the inheritance discussion gets complicated, contact this lawyer. I've already arranged everything with him. That's what she had said. So, I quickly checked the letter and called the contact written there. Hello? Sarah has passed away. Understood. I'll be right there. The lawyer, who arrived promptly as promised, greeted the gathered relatives and then took out something. It was a voice recorder. I'd like everyone to listen to this first. What's that? It's a message recorded by the deceased before her parsing. When the lawyer pressed the play button, the voice of Sarah began to flow from the recorder. Her familiar voice said, I want all of my estate to be inherited by my younger son and his wife. What is this? Why? I'm the oldest son. My brother-in-law erupted in anger, but the voice recorder continued with a valid reason. The eldest son and his wife never visited her when she was ill, and they left the care of their sick mother to the younger son's family. There was no estate to inherit for such unkind people. It was a harsh but reasonable explanation. Sarah. After words of gratitude towards us, the message ended. I couldn't hold back my tears after listening to it. Jason was also crying profusely. This was recorded by the deceased a week before her parsing. She wanted all her estate to go to her younger son and his wife. This is clearly stated in her will. The lawyer then proceeded to unfold a document on the floor. It was the will left by Sarah. Damn it. With this revelation, there was no more room for argument. My brother-in-law, clicking his tongue in frustration, left with the other relatives. This is for you. After everyone had gone, the lawyer handed me a paper bag. What's this? Something the deceased entrusted to you. Entrusted. Inside the bag were a bank book, a seal, and land deeds. But there was more. A notebook. It was a notebook. Packed inside were detailed instructions on household chores and various recipes. Sarah. She must have left this because she worried about me. Just thinking about it made me cry again. Thank you. Sarah, thank you so much. From that day on, I began reporting to Sarah's portrait whenever something happened. Sometimes it included complaints about Jason, but mostly it was positive and cheerful updates. Hey. Sarah. Then came the day for a long-awaited report. I went to the OBGYN today, and I found out I'm pregnant. It's our child, you know? I continued. Will it be a boy or a girl? I'll come back and tell you when I find out. What should we name it? Please watch over us. I whispered these thoughts in my heart. Sarah, thank you, truly. There was no response, but I'm sure. Sarah in heaven is definitely happy for us. Jack, what? You knew about Amy? Who's Mia? I asked, feeling uneasy. Please, just hear me out. Yeah, what is it? Tom is my son. What? Sure, Tom is our son. What are you talking about? No, I mean, Tom and I are biologically related. What? What are you saying? Tom, do you know who this lady is? My name is Judy. I've been married to Jack for eight years now. Jack works for a big trading company, and I work at a child welfare facility. We both love kids and expected to get pregnant soon after getting married. But one year passed, then two, and we still didn't have any children. After discussing it, we decided to visit a fertility clinic. There, we were hit with an unexpected truth. I was born with a uterine abnormality that makes it hard for me to have children, and Jack was found to have a zoospermia. The chances of natural pregnancy are almost zero. We knew many couples struggled with infertility, but never imagined it would be us. I took time accepting this harsh reality. Jack was the same. He got sick right before our wedding and had a high fever for a few days. The doctor thinks it might have affected his sperm. I just have a cold and now I'll never have child of my own. He was really down about it. I kept thinking about our parents who were eagerly waiting for a grandchild. 
Every time we visited, they'd say, can't wait to see your grandchild, but now that wish will never come true. We were in a dark place, feeling desperate. We started fertility treatments, but they didn't work, and it was overwhelming. Life goes on, though. While working at the child welfare facility, I met many kids every day, children who cannot live with their parents for different reasons. Many were emotionally scarred, but they were all innocent, honest, and hardworking. One of them grew particularly close to me. He's Tom. Tom's parents died in a car accident. At the age of two, with no family to help him, he came to our facility. He was very shy and didn't talk to much to staff or other kids. But strangely, he acted differently towards me. He'd always stay close to me. Whenever he could, he'd climb onto my lap and smile happily. Even as he get older, he remained clingy. He'd ask for hugs with his big body and show his carefree smile. He struggled with shyness at kindergarten too, finding it difficult to make friends and sometimes not wanting to go. In a place with lots of kids, I couldn't always pay attention only to Tom. Feeling frustrated, I came up with an idea and discussed it with Jack. Jack, how about considering adoption? What do you think? Jack also seemed to be struggling with our difficult journey to have a baby. After thinking for a while, he said, Adoption? Yeah, I don't just want a child with my genes. I want to raise a child with you, Judy. He said it as if convincing himself. We both wanted to raise a child together. After going through various procedures, we adopted Tom, the boy I had always been concerned about. Of course, I resigned from the facility. I thought it could make the other kids uneasy if they found out that a staff member had adopted one of them. Tom felt really nervous when he first met Jack, and he clammed up. Tom, this man is my husband. Can he be your dad? And I be your mom from now on? My mom and dad? I saw Tom's face brighten with joy. I knew it could take time, but he would eventually open up to Jack. Gradually, our family began to get closer to each other. When Tom didn't feel like going to school, we didn't force him go. Instead, we just spent a relaxed day at home, letting him be as clingy as he wanted. On Jack's days off, we would have a great time together by visiting the zoo or amusement parks. Even regular days at dinner, Tom always appeared happy and full of energy. Of course, Jack and I felt the same way. Every day was truly happy with Tom around. Gradually, he became close to Jack and now he's completely a daddy's boy. Suddenly, Tom said something that made both of us cry. I'm really glad I became your child. One day, when everything seemed fine, Jack had to go for another checkup after his company's health screening flagged something. It was a colon polyp. He had to go to the hospital for surgery. I was worried that it might be something bad, but luckily it was benign. Is that okay? After Jack's surgery, Tom rushed to Jack's side as he returned to his room. Jack held Tom's hand with a gentle smile. I was so relieved. I was worried dad might die. Now I'm not as worried. I need to use the bathroom. Tom left the room with an innocent smile. Excuse me. Right after Tom went to the bathroom, a woman's voice was heard at the room's entrance. Um, may I ask who you are? I was confused by the unknown woman, so I asked. I'm Amy, the executive secretary at William Corporation. I have some documents from the president. I know it's rude to disturb you while you're hospitalized, but he insisted it was urgent. Oh, I asked for those. Sorry to trouble you. Jack, who always dedicated to his work, had requested the documents even while in the hospital. Oh, I'm sorry for the inconvenience. I felt a bit sorry. I bowed my head as I received the documents, but the woman kept staring straight at Jack and stayed still, wondering what was going on. I was about to say something when Tom suddenly came back into the room. Hey, no running. I scolded Tom, who ran back and almost bumped into the woman. Tom! At that moment, the woman at the entrance called out Tom's name with surprised eyes. Amy? Why? Why is Tom here? I was confused. Why did this woman know Tom's name? And why did Tom call her by name? Tom, do you know this lady? I asked him cautiously. Yeah, she used to play with me a lot. She's mom's friend, right? Not you, mom, but my birth mom. Amy, I'm so happy to see you again. Tom hugged the woman with a big smile. Come to think of it, my memory is coming back. When I worked at the facility, there was a woman who regularly visited Tom, who was supposed to have no relatives. The woman in front of me, wearing glasses, high heels, and a suit, 
didn't seem to be the same as the casually dressed visitor at the facility, but when I look more closely, less, it's definitely her. I heard that a family took him in. Yeah, my mom and dad I have now. Tom pointed at us and smiled proudly. I see, that's good. I'm really glad you look happy. The woman's eyes welled up with tears, and she covered her mouth. Um, I think this is our first meeting, but I feel like I've seen you somewhere before. Jack asked curiously from the back of the bed. I thought so too. Are you Jack? I'm Amy, Mia's best friend. Jack lost his words and froze with a startled expression. Mia's? Jack muttered softly and then said to me, Sorry, Judy. Can you please leave us for a while? I hadn't seen Jack this serious in a long time. Mom, I'm thirsty. Right, Tom. Could you go buy some juice for Amy and Dad, please? Sure. Let's go, Mom. Tom led me out of the room, and I felt very anxious. What is all about? Who is Mia? Despite my niece, I had no choice but to go to the store on the first floor store as Tom told. After we bought juice and came back, Amy was just leaving the room. Oh, Mrs. Judy, Jack wants to talk to you alone. I'll watch Tom here. Thank you. Eager to know what had happened, I agreed to Amy's offer and left Tom with her, hurrying back into the room. Jack, what's going on? You know Amy? Who's Mia? I bombarded him with questions, as my anxiety growing. Please, calm down and listen. Yeah, what is it? Tom is my son. What? Yes, Tom is our son. What are you talking about? No, I mean, Tom and I are biologically related. What are you saying? I couldn't understand. Tom's biological parents had died in an accident. He was placed in the facility because of that. Mia was a woman I dated before I met you, when I was 20. Amy is Mia's best friend, and Ivy also met her a few times. I see. But how is Tom your son? Jack bit his lip and glanced downward before speaking with a tense voice. I didn't know. When Mia and I broke up, I had no idea she was pregnant with my child. He had just heard about it for the first time from Amy. After breaking up with Jack, Mia realized she was pregnant and decided to have the baby alone. A friend from her childhood, who knew about her situation, kindly accepted Mia and her unborn child, and they got married later on. Amy, as Mia's best friend, supported them. Mia, who having lost her parents early, struggled with parenting alone. Amy was worried and sometimes took care of Tom. When Tom was two years old, a tragedy struck. The car driven by Mia's husband was rear-ended by a drunk driver and car fire, killing both Mia and her husband. Afterward, Tom was placed in a childcare facility. Amy, who was worried about him, visited him frequently. Amy was feeling conflicted because she knew about the situation. Does she need to tell Jack, who is Tom's biological father, about Tom's existence and Mia's death, but without any contact information, it remained unresolved. Tom is really your biological child? I can't believe it. It's like a miracle. Jack, with a somber face. I'm sorry, Judy. It must be shocking for you to know about having a child with someone else. He apologized. But my heart felt light. I was simply happy. Yes, I was surprised, but I felt saved knowing that the child I love carries Jack's blood. It wasn't a mistake. This encounter was meant to be. I felt it. From now on, nothing will change. I'll continue to pour my love into him just as before. Let's raise this child with all our love, for Mia's sake too. Thank you. I'm so glad I married you, Judy. We hugged each other and cried. Later, Jack was discharged from the hospital safely. We formed a bond with Amy, and she started visiting her home occasionally. Most importantly, Tom always asked, When is Amy coming next? Tom always looked forward to her visits. She never missed bringing gifts for Christmas or birthdays and spent time playing with Tom. As time went by, Tom grew older and eventually reaching his high school graduation year. Jack and I had decided to tell him the truth when he reached the age of 18. Tom knew we were his adoptive parents, but how would he react to the fact that he was biologically related to his father? I was a bit worried. It's a sensitive age, and he might get angry or sad when he found out that we kept something from him. But Tom listened calmly to his father's story. Tom, I had you with a woman I dated before. That's the truth. You might have thought we weren't related by blood, but we are. I'm sorry for keeping it a secret until now. Jack bravely apologized to his son. Tom seemed a little confused at first but then said, 
Why apologize? I'm happy. I never expected to meet my biological father because I thought he was dead. It's a bit shocking, but it's a happy surprise. Tom scratched his head, looking embarrassed. I'm just grateful to the dad and mom who adopted me from the facility. Whether we're related by blood or not doesn't matter. I'll keep doing my best, so please keep watching over me. Thank you. Tom became a kind and strong person as grew up. Jack and I couldn't stop ourselves from crying. We informed Amy, who always looked out for her family, and she came to celebrate his graduation. I'm so happy for you, Tom. Mia would feel the same way, she said while crying. Tom being placed in the facility where I worked. Amy, who is Mia's best friend and knew the situation, brought some documents to my husband's hospital. All these events seemed like miracles. Of course, the death of Mia and her husband was truly tragic. It undoubtedly made Tom feel very sad. But now, Tom is living happily. It's all thanks to these miraculous encounters. Grateful for this, today and every day, our family of three gathers around the dinner table with smiles. I really hope this happiness lasts forever.